Hello, welcome to the Monday, May 24th, 2021 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida, still but uh, virtually teaching this week in London. So the podcast may be published at a little bit odd times. And actually, we will be switching back to a life training, or at least for sort of a hybrid mode. And London is one of the cities that I'm scheduled uh, in teaching in, in July and then August. Uh, No guarantees yet whether or not this will be in person. It could also be still virtually, but in a classroom. But let's take a look at uh, diaries that came in over the weekend. Xavier ran across an interesting phishing email that performs phishing without any servers. Not only is the HTML page embedded in the email, that's a fairly common trick, but usually JavaScript within that HTML will then submit harvested credentials to a particular web service that collects them. This particular phishing email took a little bit of a different approach. It took advantage of an API that's offered by smtpjs.com. And that API essentially sort of creates a gateway between JavaScript and SMTP. You register with smtpjs.com and then you obtain JavaScript that will send a request to smtpjs.com and then relay it via your SMTP server. Personally, I would actually recommend against using smtpjs.com even for legitimate purposes. Yes, uh, the credentials are not directly exposed to the user via JavaScript. Instead, the credentials are turned to a token that's then included in the JavaScript. However, you have to deposit your credentials with for your SMTP server with smtpjs.com. So really all they're doing is then connecting to your SMTP server. There are, I think, a couple better APIs that use their own SMTP servers. Of course, that can be a little bit more tricky if you have to use a specific SMTP server for email security purposes like DMARC. The token that's exposed to the user is static, so each user gets the same token. You can limit it to a certain domain, but still looks like there are probably ways how an attacker could use the token to send spam on your behalf. So overall, fine for phishing and fine for some uh, smaller websites probably, but uh, there are probably some better options if you just want to trigger email from a JavaScript. And that typically would involve you running a server with some code that then connects to a proper API without exposing any credentials to the user. And in the second diary by Xavier, we uh, do have an interesting anti-debugging technique that is used by malware to make reverse analysis more difficult. This technique locks kernel 32.dll, so it provides exclusive access to the file to the malware, but that of course then conflicts with the debugger that also needs access to kernel 32.dll, which then causes the malware to crash. Interesting workaround here, just create a copy of kernel 32.dll and then patch the malware to lock that copied file and everything should be good. An interesting tidbit about the HTTP.sys vulnerability that Microsoft patched. It turns out that WinRM, the Windows Remote Manager on port 5985, is also vulnerable. No big surprise here. It's implementing an HTTP API and pretty much any service that implements HTTP on Windows tends to use HTTP.sys. So that's another thing to check uh, where you may not believe that you are vulnerable, but you actually are. WinRM should never really be exposed on the internet, but according to Shodan, there are about 2 million exposed systems. 
And we have an interesting exploit against uh, Firefox that relies on Firefox uh, confusing content types. The content type has to be text HTML as returned from the server and the file name being returned should be a JPEG. What happens next is that Firefox will offer to display the file in the default viewer, which should be your web browser. The file is then being downloaded and your web browser is opened with the HTML file and any JavaScript in the HTML file may be executed. It's really easy to configure a web server to exhibit that behavior with the wrong content type. Of course, exploitation here does require some user collaboration. However, the user doesn't really necessarily understand what's happening here. And of course, JavaScript then loaded from a local file, like in this case, has extra privileges and may be able to execute code on the system. Mozilla was informed of this issue and uh, the details have now been published after a 90 day grace period expired. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.